wolves, both a symbol of nature's wild beauty and, for many, a storybook villain. After the signing of the Endangered Species Act in 1973, wolf recovery became a priority of the U.S. government. In the 1990s, the government implemented multiple wolf reintroduction programs across the U.S. Today, wolf populations are recovering or recolonizing from Canada, but the government is concerned that wolf return could lead to increased conflicts with livestock and people. The government has often proposed policies that allow wolves to be lethally controlled, stating that such methods decrease conflicts and increase tolerance for wolves. In this video, we describe results from our study on the effect of similar policies on Mexican wolves, an endangered subspecies of gray wolves in the U.S. Southwest. Here, we present evidence of how reduced protections have increased poaching of Mexican wolves and hindered the recovery of the species. Poaching, which we define as the illegal killing of a wild animal, is the major cause of death for large carnivore populations around the world and definitely the case for wolves, whether there are red wolves and gray wolves in the U.S. or the Mexican gray wolves we'll be talking about in this paper. Our lab, the Carnivore Coexistence Lab, has been focusing attention on how different government policies affect the rate of poaching within wolf populations, especially wolf populations that are endangered. There's a widespread notion among wildlife agencies in North America and Europe that blood buys goodwill. That phrase, blood buys goodwill, conveys the idea that legalizing killing of some controversial wildlife like wolves uh, can actually help their conservation. There's two proposed mechanisms in this hypothesis of blood buys goodwill. The first mechanism is that when the government allows a little bit of killing of controversial wild animals like wolves, that people will have a better attitude and be more tolerant for the survivors and so support conservation of the surviving controversial species. The second element is the idea that when the government allows a little bit of legal killing, people won't take recourse in a lot of illegal killing so that too might support uh, conservation. This is an idea popular with North American and Northern European governments as well as some interest groups like hunters. Now the alternative also potentially makes a lot of sense, which is that when governments loosen protections for controversial wildlife, people actually uh, ramp up their illegal killing thinking that there are enough of the controversial species or that enforcement against poaching will be relaxed. And so it might have the opposite effect of blood actually leading to more blood. Mexican gray wolves, also known as lobos, are the southernmost, smallest, and most genetically distinct subspecies of gray wolf, Canis lupus, in North America. Predator eradication programs initiated by the federal government in the early 1900s were effective in killing all Mexican gray wolves in the wild throughout their entire historic range. Only seven Mexican wolves were captured alive before 1980. All but one were caught in Mexico. Following decades of captive breeding, the first Mexican wolves were introduced into the Southwest in 1998. About 150 lobos have been released from captivity to the wild up to the present day. And the current wild population in Arizona and New Mexico is estimated to be a minimum of 186 wolves. Our research focused on the threat of human-caused mortality. We examined the fates of radio-colored wolves across policy periods where regulations varied with regard to the level of protection afforded the wolves. The original 1998 regulation was in place through 2014. However, management authority over the wild population was formally ceded to the states of Arizona and New Mexico and other non-federal cooperators. For the six-year period from 2004 through 2009, this graph shows that the wild population declined from 55 to 42 wolves over that span of time. What was different? The states implemented a strictly enforced provision called Standard Operating Procedure 13 which required the permanent removal of any wolf implicated in preying on livestock three or more times in the span of one year. Settlement of a lawsuit 
ended this practice and returned management authority to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in late 2009. The next policy change came in 2015 with a new regulation that replaced the original 1998 regulation. The new regulation expanded the circumstances under which wild wolves could be killed or removed and placed in captivity. But decision authority remained with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In our study, we evaluate how two periods of reduced ESA protections for the Mexican wolf, SOP 13 and the 2015 10J rule change, affected the risk of wolves reaching the end of monitoring by multiple causes, such as removal or killing by agency staff, natural causes, reported poaching, non-criminal incidents such as collisions, or disappearance from monitoring. We did so by analyzing data collected by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Mexican Wolf Recovery Program and their Office of Law Enforcement. These data sets included the monitoring history, including dates for start of monitoring and date of death or disappearance for all collared and monitored adult Mexican wolves in the wild since the beginning of the recovery program in March of 1998 up to December 31st of 2016 for a total of 279 wolves. We use survival analysis techniques to estimate the risk of wolves reaching these endpoints both inside and outside each of these types of policy period, full Endangered Species Act protections and reduced protections through SOP 13 or the 2015 10J rule change. These statistical techniques are used widely in biomedical trials for interventions like vaccines or surgeries. The general idea in our context is that wolves enter our analysis as soon as they are collared by agency staff. Then the agency implements an intervention among all Mexican wolves, one being SOP 13, the second one being the 2015 10J rule, so that we have various periods of different wolves being exposed to the two different policy periods. We are then able to use this monitoring data to estimate how the exposure to those policy interventions affected, that is, did it increase or decrease the survival time of the individuals exposed to it, relative to individuals that were killed outside those periods of reduced protections. Since we account for various causes of death and disappearance, we are also able to tease out a specific policy effect for each of these endpoints. Our results show that the likelihood of wolves disappearing was 121% higher when the policies reduced full protections on wolves. Wolves can disappear for one of three major reasons. First, wolves have died and their collars destroyed. This almost only occurs due to cryptic poaching. Second, a wolf has migrated far enough out of the study area that the agency can no longer detect the signal. And third, the collar has simply ceased to work, generally as a result of battery failure. So which of these three explanations is responsible in this case? Wolves cannot understand policy changes, so a significant change in wolf migration behavior as a result of policies could only occur if, for example, during policies of reduced wolf protection, the agency was harassing wolves or killing alphas, thereby disbanding packs and increasing migration. However, when we look at agency removals, when reduced protection policies were in effect, we find that the agency did not remove significantly more wolves than they did during periods of stricter or full protection. Further, the agency's behaviors in choosing wolves to remove did not change between periods. Therefore, migration as an explanation for wolf disappearances is highly unlikely. Radio collar failure is also unlikely to change as a result of policy. Therefore, the most logical explanation is that people have changed their behavior towards wolves and have increased their cryptic poaching. I remind you again that while wolves do not understand policies, people do. Our interpretation of these findings, given their consistency with past studies on attitudes towards wolves and wolf populations, 
is that when policies are implemented, which reduce the value of non-human beings, such as policies which enable their killing for the sole benefit of human actors, there will be increased harm to those beings and damage done to the environment, including crimes. Our results are critical to policy decisions under consideration by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the near future. Two of these policy reviews were triggered by citizen litigation. One court decision ruled that the 2015 regulation was not based on the best science and would not result in sufficient recovery to remove the Mexican gray wolf from the endangered species list. The court has ordered the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to revise the 2015 regulation. The second lawsuit challenged the scientific validity of the 2017 revised Mexican wolf recovery plan. Specifically, the court ruled that the recovery plan failed to adequately address the risk of human-caused mortality in its recovery criteria. A court order specifying a remedy to that deficiency in the recovery plan is expected soon. A third policy called the McKittrick policy issued by the Department of Justice. He instructs federal judges to inform juries and prosecutors that they must have proof that a person who killed an endangered species knew in advance the identity of the animal and its status as a federally listed endangered species. This policy has essentially stymied prosecution of wolf killers who claim they thought they were shooting a coyote or some other animal. Conservationists are urging the Biden administration to abolish this policy. So now that we understand that the policy of loosening Endangered Species Act protections for Mexican wolves actually seemed to uh, drive poaching underground uh, to make it more cryptic and increase the absolute rate of cryptic poaching, we have to ask ourselves, what do we do about it? How do we prevent that unintended consequence of the policy change? For one thing, federal agencies like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service need to be more transparent about the data, reporting all the radio collared wolves, those that disappear, as well as those that are found, and the date of first collaring and date of last contact with each of those radio collars, because that's going to allow independent scientists like our team to help advise them on the effectiveness of their policy. Secondly, we need policymakers to abandon the hypothesis of blood buys goodwill, because over the last 10 years, Years, none of its mechanisms have been supported with scientific research, and the opposite seems to be the case. That blood simply uh, leads to more bloodshed. That leads us to a recommendation about anti-poaching interventions. We just need good, thoughtful community outreach that holds a firm line on what's illegal and what's legal. Uh, encouraging non-lethal methods of protecting domestic animals and discouraging uh, illegal activities and anything that's going to harm habitats and wildlife. Community-engaged policing is a very good model of how we need to do uh, anti-poaching interventions in the future to protect uh, our nation's legacy of endangered species.